Hello and welcome to Once Upon a Time, Seven Story Types and When to Use Them. My name is Jewel Array and I am a product manager at Tableau covering storytelling. So a lot of people kind of ask me, what does that even mean? What, how do I use storytelling? If you write any kind of report, if you send emails that have pictures of visits in them, if you just tell someone step by step how you arrived at a decision, that's all data storytelling. It doesn't necessarily have to be about, you know, something super emotional that children will die if we don't do this thing. Sometimes it's just like our business will be better if we do this thing. Let me prove to you why. Uh, this is kind of being weird, so I'm going to take that out. Um, so first of all, here is my email address and my Twitter in case you want to, you know, take pictures of me while I'm doing this with like hashtag best presentation ever. I'll give you some good poses right now so you get your cameras ready. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, that's out of the way. Uh, there's also my email address if you have questions about storytelling, if you want to be kind of in the loop when I'm th thinking about new storytelling features and you want to be there to help me think through them, uh, feel free to email me. So, for the other purposes of this presentation, you need to know that I am not just a data rock star, I am an actual rock star. I play bass in a band called Golden Idols. And something you might not know about bands these days, having a band, is there's actually a lot of data that goes with having a band. So things like your streams on Spotify and Pandora and all those kinds of things, your sales, how many CDs did you sold, how much merch did you sell, how much did you uh, take home after a show, things like your social media, how are you reaching new fans. So there's a lot of stuff here. A lot of it can help you figure out what's working, what isn't, and how to reach a bigger audience and become a better band. But the problem is, as you can imagine, Musicians aren't necessarily data people. So one of my, one of my bandmates is also a coworker at Tableau, so he kind of likes data. I love data. The other two, I can't really get them to care about these things. And they're not people that I can just show one chart out of context and say like, see, look at this. Obviously, we should post more photos on Facebook. I have to set it up and bring some context. And that's really where data storytelling comes in. So what we're doing here today is we're talking about seven basic data story types. So this is kind of our take on the seven basic plots. So think of like rags to riches or like hero's journey, those kinds of plots. In the same way, we have some basic data stories we can tell. And I'm not saying that these are the only data stories that are out there, but these are the ones we're going to talk about today. And so for each of these, I'm going to kind of just give you a brief what it is, I'm going to give you a little walkthrough on how I would go about making one of these stories. And then really what I think is the important thing to drive home in this presentation is why do you make this story? What discussions are you trying to start? Because as uh, my good friend Andy Cockreave says, one of my favorite Andy Cockreave quotes is, data isn't the end of a conversation, it's the beginning of one. So what discussion are you trying to make happen by telling this story? And then also, what action are you trying to drive by telling this story? So let's start with the first one, change over time. So as you can imagine, this is pretty simple. You take one factor, you look at it over time. That's pretty simple. So what are you looking for? Trends, outliers, that kind of thing. So let's take an example. Come on. So here I have a Tableau workbook, and I've already made my line graph here. So this is data from Spotify on our monthly listeners. It's actually a metric that doesn't exist anymore as of like a week ago, but I started this presentation before then. So that's why my data isn't updated. Uh, so this is our monthly listeners over time. So how many people were listening to us that month on that given day? And you can see we have some spikes here, and there's probably some stuff I'm going to want to point out. And let's see what we do. So one of the first things I might do when approaching a change over time story is if I know specific events to overlay over the story, I'll do those first. So I probably don't really need to call it out, but why not? We can say for the very first one, 
I could maybe annotate this and say that this is when our first EP was released. And I'll just move that annotation to a better spot. Cool. And then, let's make that a new point so I have this base one. I also know that right here, January 15th, that's when our full length album was released. So I'm going to annotate that one. So I just right click, I say annotate, I'm going to annotate this point, get rid of some of this other stuff, oops, this is when our full length was, well, let's just say LP. That's when our LP was released. So you can see for our EP, when that was released, oh, let me make this a new one. When our EP was released, it kind of initially hit the most plays about later that month and then never really reached there again. And then our LP was released and it looked like our average is basically higher. And that's a point I might want to call out because really when I'm talking about change over time, I'm talking about comparing what happened in one time and what happened in another and how are they different? How did these events that I just marked really make a difference? So I have another timeline here that I'm gonna bring in. I'm just gonna drag it from the left and drop it into my navigator. And this one you can see I put an average line in. That way I can do something like this where I take everything before the LP release and then maybe I'll make a note here like uh, average listeners was around 23 for, or let's say before the LP. Okay, that little mark there. And then maybe I'll drag another one in and this time I'll do it after the LP. <laughs> Average listeners went up to 68. So that's cool. That probably means our LP was better than our EP, which is awesome, and it was, if you're listening. If you wanna go check it out later, I suggest starting with the LP. But there's one more kind of interesting thing happening here, and that's this huge jump right here. So that's probably something else I'm gonna to wanna to call out. Oops. Didn't mean to unhighlight all of those. So let's add another blank timeline without the average. I actually know what happened here. So again, if I was going back to kind of my overlaying dates, I might add right around this day. The reason we saw such a big jump in listeners is because I made a playlist of surf music. So our band plays mostly 60s inspired, like surf, doo-wop, psych. Um, what, wait, Skylar, what was it? My friend at Spotify over here just told me one of our actual tags is deep surf. I don't know what that means, but it's cool. <laughs> so around this day, I created a surf music playlist and I shared it out to all of my friends and I actually made a little Spotify ad for it. So as you can imagine, if something is a Spotify ad and it's on a playlist so other people are finding it from different reasons, they're not directly going to your page, that's going to lead to a broader audience because it's not just people specifically looking for you. So we saw a huge boost in listeners after that. So if I was starting some discussions here, I might say something like, 
even in a release that wasn't as good, we still saw an initial boost of listeners. So maybe we should be releasing more often instead of having this really like year-long period in between releases. And either way, every time you release, you get a little bit of a bump. So that would be kind of the, what I'm illustrating with the averages. And then another point I could make is like, another way we could increase the number of people listening to us is try to make more playlists, because sometimes they don't want to listen to just us. They want to listen to it in a whole curated vibe. So that's a change over time story. So again, discussions that could be started with a change over time story. Sometimes you just want to know what happened. Sometimes it's a part of you know, a retrospective review process, so that might be a reason you want to do that where you're overlaying events. Um, sometimes you want to ask, did you meet your metrics, or were you successful? Did you get what needed to be done happen? Other times, you might be trying to plan ahead and trying to do something. So maybe in this case, maybe we were thinking about releasing another album and we wanted to figure out what would be the best month to do that. A change over time story where we're looking at all of the different releases and how they kind of turned out based on when they started, that might be a good time to do that. So one is a good time to do a thing. Uh, another thing is having your team be prepared for if you see something that happens as a trend over time. So say around every Christmas, people don't listen to my band as much. Maybe we should make a Christmas song or something so that people do. So again, kind of building on that, the actions that are really driven after you tell a change over time story. Your team is prepared to do a thing at a certain time, or your team is choosing the best time to do something. And just a couple of tips when you're getting started with a change over time story. So overlaying known events, that's what I did at the beginning of my change over time story. It's a really good way to get started. If you don't have any known events, maybe just look at the min and the max and different outliers and then work backwards from there. You know that these dates were weird. See if you can figure out what happened on those dates. Another thing you can do is divide. If you have a really long time series, it's a really long data set, maybe don't do it you know, on a daily basis. That's going to be hard to read. Divide it into chunks. Do decades, years, quarters, months, whatever makes sense for the level of granularity that you're trying to make decisions on. And then comparing different type chunks of time. So let's compare this fall to this spring, this quarter to this quarter, and ask what the differences was between how you were looking at that metric. And maybe that'll illuminate some things of why there was discrepancies in the data. So our next story is drilling down or drilling up. So what a drill story is, is we're really looking at hierarchical data. So this is whenever you have something that's like product, category, subcategory, that kind of thing. Um, and originally, we were kind of just talking about this when we were making these seven stories as drilling down. But I think you could also drill up. And that's actually the example I want to show to you. So when you're trying to decide if you're going to drill down or up, it's really what level of context do you need to provide for people? Are these people, the people you're presenting to, are they people on the ground that know a lot about this particular subset, but they need to get the broader picture? Then you should drill up. Are they someone who is very broadly focused? Maybe it's someone on your leadership team or something, but they don't know on the ground what's happening? Then maybe you should drill down. So let's take a look at a drill story. I'm actually going to drill up this time. So this is actually based on a true example. Um, I met someone who works at um, now Napster, formerly known as Rhapsody. And uh, they were trying to tell me, oh, you guys actually have like, a pretty good following on our platform. And if you want, I can work with you to try to grow your base. And like, you know, we can work out some discounts on ads and that kind of thing. So I said, cool, let me, uh, let me take a look at my data. Because I, I have data on how much we earn from every different streaming service because my um, distributor collects that information for us when they're doing technical royalties. So I started here at this, OK, this is just streaming, world music we've made from streaming. Where does Rhapsody fall here? So Rhapsody is down here. Most of our streaming really comes from Spotify. And uh, I did something kind of tricky here at first because I was trying to make a point because my, my band was all like, yeah, this sounds great. Why wouldn't we take the free help? 
And I was like, eh, I don't know if it's going to be as helpful as you guys think it is. I don't think we should spend money on this. And uh, one thing that's always fun to do in a story is to kind of like give them their assumption and then make it, turn it on their head. And so in this case, they figured that Rhapsody was probably lower, but how low they didn't actually realize. Um, again, this is a fun trick you get to play when your band are not data people. So they didn't notice the scale here is a logarithmic scale. So if we actually edit this axis, and there we go. That's actually how much money we get from Spotify versus Rhapsody. And then, so I'm like, okay, most of our streaming, it's almost non-existent. If you look, I think Rhapsody is something like 16 cents if you actually look at how much we've earned. So our platform with like a ton of followers, I don't know what that means to them. Either they don't pay very much or uh, we don't actually have that many followers. And then I wanted to put that into context, so I'm going to drill up a level and say like, but really streaming revenue is not even very much at all compared to what we make. Most of our money is made from live performances. So if we were really trying to maximize like how do we get the most money the quickest because we're trying to record a new album or something like that, trying to focus on something like let's put more ads in this platform that we apparently have fans on. Um, it's probably not as good of a call as just, let's play more shows. We get paid for shows a lot more. So that's an example of drilling up. So the discussions that are started when you're drilling down or up. If you're drilling down, you're usually thinking broadly about a big, high category that you care about. And you want to find what's that small piece that affects the big one that I care about. So what is a piece that we might not have been thinking about, but it's affecting the piece we do care about, so let's drill down and try to find that. Uh, if you're drilling up, it's like the story I just told. How does this thing that we're trying to talk about, how does it affect the system as a whole? So I have my little piece of data about this particular streaming service. How does that work compared to the rest of them? And then. What, is, what are things that we need to be cognizant of when we're making decisions about our particular factors? So we can see, if we can see the hierarchy of what's going on and know that, hey, this thing usually affects this bigger thing in this way, then we know when we're doing anything on that smaller, more granular you know, piece or category, how it's going to affect the bigger one. And so the actions that are really driven from this kind of story we have a better understanding of how one particular measure just affects the overall system. And the, system, the team can take the whole system into consideration when they're talking about the little piece that they own. So some tips when you're doing drilling down or up, and I kind of went over this, but I really just want to drill this home. <laughs> uh, when you're choosing whether to go down or up, Stories are really everything is about context. So start with the context that they know. If they know the big piece, you drill down. If they know the small piece, you drill up. That's whenever you're starting any kind of story, the very first point should be, what do you already know? And then going from there. So similar, but with some key differences, is zooming in and out. So the real difference between um, drilling down and up and zooming in and out is that down and up is about hierarchical data. It's about different levels of detail, really, is what you're looking at. Zooming in and out is more about one, one measure, say it's geography, say it's time, something like that. You can do zooming in and out on things that aren't maps, um, but maps are usually a favorite for doing this, and just going to different places, seeing where the thing is. And again, like drilling down and up, you can start small and go broad, or you can start broad and go small. So it's really about what context do these people already have. So let's look at a Zoom story. Here are basically all the shows that my band has played in the past uh, 
year and a half or so. So you can see we did a little mini tour down here, but it wasn't much. But I might just start here because we're starting broad. Here's all the shows we've played in the last two years. So now let's zoom in. So I live in Seattle, so you're gonna see that most of our shows are in the Seattle area. I'm gonna make this a new point by clicking the Save as New Point button. So the size of these are the average earnings per show, and the color is how much merch we sold at that show. And you can see using 10.5 beta, I got those tool tips in there. So I'm going to focus even more, so I'm going to say, for the most part, let's, uh, we don't need to talk about this show in Polsbo, although that was a very fun show. So here's our home base. And then I'm going to zoom in even closer to this spot up here. So you can see there's actually a ton of venues up here in the north side, and those are the places we play the most, and this is actually the place where we've earned the most as well. So this is the Ballard-Fremont area. Seems to like us the most. So you can see we've done four shows over there. Everything pays pretty well. So that's the Zoom story. We're really taking, in, in this case, the geographical aspect of it was actually an important dimension to look at. And that's kind of what the Zooming was doing, was focusing you into, oh, there's this neighborhood. That's where most of our shows happen. Um, so it's actually a, we used this very story to determine um, where should our new practice space be? Because our practice space was actually we look at all of Seattle, our practice space was like down here, but all of our shows are basically up here. So it was kind of a pain. We were actually between two train tracks where if you're a musician, you're already 15 minutes late for sound check. And then there's two train tracks on either side. And we would always, definitely if you were late, you get stuck between the train tracks and they're like by the pier. So they just, they go really slowly because they're getting loaded. And then sometimes they start going backward and you're just like, oh my God, why? So that's that, sorry, little aside there. <laughs> Ballard, definitely much more sensible place for us to have a practice space. So what are the discussions you're trying to start when you're zooming in and out? A lot of it is about comparison. So just taking a broad view, if you're looking at everything all at the same time, how is this doing in relation to others? How are we doing when we play shows at sunset versus when we play shows at crocodile? Or what is the baseline we should be measuring success by? So we could get a broad view of like, it looks like at most shows we make about 100 to 200 bucks. If we're getting paid less than that, maybe we shouldn't play that place anymore. So you can look at the averages and say, yeah, maybe that's not a thing we should focus on. And then you can start to ask why. Why are some places more successful than others? So that's when you're gonna really start the discussion, start looking for other data, try to see maybe Sunset, they book us a lot, and they tend to book us for bands that are bigger than us and let us open for it. So that's like a good way to get a lot more people to the show and um, to make new fans. So maybe that's a place we want to keep playing. So the actions that are really driven by zooming in and out is you're really given more context. This is all about context, about where it is or um, about how one section compares to another. So you can actually, and I think I talk about this on tips, so some tips, this technique obviously really powerful when working on maps, but it can also be a pretty useful skill on a time series. So in a way, what I did with the average lines on the first story is almost a hybrid. That was kind of a zoom part. Like I could maybe zoom just to that section, say like this is where we're at for average listeners, and then back out, zoom to the other one and say this is where we're at here. So there's a, a lot of these stories, there's kind of some overlap, and a lot of times you're gonna do those kind of combo stories where you're using multiple of these um, story types.
Okay. Our next story are contrasts. So contrasts are really you're comparing two kind of somewhat disparate things or comparing things between different categories, comparing the progress of one group or of, over another. Um, pretty self-explanatory, I think. But let's, take a, let's take a look at a contrast story. So the, for this one, I'm using data from my Facebook page. And we were really trying to determine when is the best time to make Facebook posts. It's our main way of communicating with our fans, announcing things, that kind of stuff. So it'd be a good idea to know when things happen. So we wanted to compare and contrast when do we actually post and when do people interact with things. So over here on the left, this is when we've posted. So the time, the, most of our posts have happened on Mondays at around 6 p.m. But most of the times that people have shared our posts have been more Tuesdays. Or if we look at likes, you can look at comments. So already we've started a discussion that says there's some kind of discrepancy between when we're posting and when people actually interact. So let's dig into that a little deeper. I have some other Facebook data here. There is a really awesome table on your Facebook Insights page, if any of you do social media analytics, that says just of the people who like your page, when are they online? Not necessarily looking at your page, just when are they online? And so this is what we found. So this is a heat map. So we have hours going down this way. We have days of the week going this way. So each box is an hour on a day. So it looked like when we, I put the min and max in here. So the worst time we could possibly post would be Sunday at 4 a.m. Not a whole lot of action going on then. One of the best times is Monday at noon, that first day of the week. People take their lunch break. They're like, thank God, they get on Facebook. That's the best time. Mondays at 12 PM are best. So we took that data. And this is actually, so this one was somewhat old data. And I'm going to show you our new data now. So here we're comparing and contrasting when are our fans online. So this is basically just a bar chart version of that one. And how many, uh, when do we actually post? So I don't know where my labels went, but best times to post, Monday at noon, Tuesday at noon, Monday at 1, basically that beginning of the week afternoon, no one actually wants to work time. And the times that we ended up starting to post more because we started to notice this pattern was Monday at 11, Tuesday at 12, so right, right aligned in there. So that's a contrast story. So what kind of discussions get started when you're doing a contrast story? Well, first, what accounts for these differences? So you could see me, you'd hear me kind of doing that reasoning. Why do people, why are people online on Mondays and Tuesdays in the early afternoon? And why aren't we posting then? Well, because I am not a slacker and I don't go on Facebook at noon on Mondays, but maybe I should, and now I do, because data told me to. So sorry, Tableau, if you see it, it's your fault, your data is the one who told me that I should go on Facebook, sorry. Uh, and then like, how do you align these things better? That's a discussion that starts. So you saw, after we saw the first chart and like, oh, well, most of our posting happens in the evening time on Mondays and it doesn't really seem like there's that many people online at that point. So how do we align these things more? Well, we should post earlier in the day on Monday because that's when we're gonna get the most traffic. So the actions that you're really driving, you're trying to look for what's making these differences, what are the externalities between these things. And then you're learning kind of the success or failure in one group can teach you success or how to succeed or fail in the other one to help emulate success or avoid pitfalls. And so some tips for these contrasts. Um, Sometimes you don't want to show just the main things that you think you're interested in. Show everything else that's surrounding and affecting this data because that's how you're going to find, you know, what are those, those outside externalities. 
And another good way to orient your audience is just to give like across the board, start broad, give across the board averages. So like this is on average how many people are online at any given time. Now we can see how much better it is on Mondays at one or how much worse it is on Mondays at six. I didn't do that, I'm sorry, I'm not following my own tips. <laughs> All right, next story, intersections. So this is actually, this is my favorite one. This one is a really cool one. So intersections are when you have different groups. A lot of times this is going to be over time. And you're pointing out shifts of one, one category overtakes another. And a lot of times these are important things to your business to figure out what that means. So here is my intersection story. So the data that we're looking at is Spotify data again. And on Spotify, when you are looking at where people listen to your music, you're given some options. Um, it tells you, are people listening on your artist page? So they're searching for golden idols. They're going there and they're playing directly from there. Are they saving to their own playlists? So they're taking those and listening on their own because they put it on a playlist that they listen to. Are they listening on other people's playlists? Did they find like a curated playlist either by Spotify or just a friend or some random person on the internet and it happened to have your song on it and so now they're listening to it? Um, are, is it coming from radio? So Spotify does do some radio play if you go on different kinds of um, stations. And then there's other sources. So just is it showing up on websites or that kind of thing? And so I've been looking at quarter by quarter how many people are listening on each one of these sources because some of these sources are better than others. If we're seeing a lot of traffic coming to our artist page. That's kind of cool because that knows, that alerts us that people are searching for us. So people are hearing about us, they're looking at us up and then they're playing it from there. But something that's really cool is if they hear it on other people's playlists because that means reach is broadened. They don't have to hear about us before they hear us. They don't have to know who we are before they listen to us. So if we take a look here, this green section is our artist profile. So it kind of makes sense that at the very beginning, most people are going to listen pretty much directly from our artist profile. And I guess early on, a couple people saved sub songs to their playlists in that first quarter. But for the most part, that's where it was. Since then, it kind of went down. When we released our full length, again, people were searching for us, looking on the artist profile. This blue one is people's, other people's saved playlists. So you can see as time went on, people were saving to their playlists more and more. And then it kind of dropped significantly. And we saw this rise of other people's playlists. So if you remember that first change over time story and that huge jump over here, that's really kind of the same data showing this in a different way. People listen, more people are listening and they're listening on this playlist instead of on um, our profile. So what the intersections are, are any time this line crosses. That's kind of an event we might want to point out. So like right here, this is the point where more people are listening and saving our music than looking for us. So that might mean a couple of things if I wanted to point this out and say uh, this is the point at which saved music overtakes searches. Now, depending on what our goals were, this might be a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe more people were saving our music. That's cool. That means we have fans. Maybe less people are looking for us, and it's like, oh, well, the only people really listening to us are people who already know us. That's not good. And then we see it crosses back because our LP is released. More people looking us up. And then right here, we can talk about the success of the beach playlist that I had with all the surf music on it. So those are intersections. You're talking about when one thing overtakes another.
So what discussions are started? Well, the first one, a very obvious one, what caused this? Why are people searching more than saving to their playlists or vice versa? And were these things good? Some of these, I'm not even really sure if they're good. They're, but this is a good way to start that conversation with my band. We should talk about, do we want people searching for us? Or do we want people being fans? And depending on where we are in our career, what we're trying to do next, one could be true over the other. Um, how did these shifts affect our overall goals? So if we were really focused on, like, we want people discovering us, we want, people, we want to drive people to our, to our artist page because we're doing stuff with playlists there and there's concert information there, so maybe we want to drive that. But we saw this shift of playlists, people save music going up. What can we do to drive that down? And should we change our strategy based on, oh, we just saw this, this section overtake another one, should we maybe start concentrating on how to mitigate that or how to support that? So the actions taken is really that you start to examine why these shifts happen, and then you try to prevent or promote them in the future. Are you trying to have one category take over another or not? And some tips. Um, one way that's kind of a cool way to do this is when you're building your story, instead of looking at the whole thing all at once like I did, go up and just start from you know, your baseline, quarter one, draw it up into the first intersection. That will make it a little more suspenseful. That's always fun when you're trying to tell a story. Uh, a lot of other story types can be used in conjunction with this one to start to dissect that intersection. So a good one that I could think of might be take an intersection and then start drilling down. That would be a good combo to do, kind of a one-two punch of, this is what's happening, now why is it happening? All right, let's talk about factors. So factors is when you're really trying to find causation or correlation between a couple different things. You have one thing, you have all these other things, you're trying to find out kind of what's the line of best fit. So for our factor story, we're going to go back to social media data. So this right now, what we're looking at is the number of impressions on Facebook posts. And I have it aggregated up to the week level, because otherwise it was kind of a crazy mess. So this is our impressions per week on our Facebook page. So we might start there. We might try to start finding other info to look at. Um, this lighter pink line, so this darker pink is our total impressions. Lighter pink is impressions just of people who already like our page. Now when you're talking about impressions, impressions is anytime someone comes across this post somewhere. And in Facebook, a lot of times that's when someone creates a story by commenting or liking or sharing your story. So it can often be shown to people who aren't following your page. And when you're trying to build a fan base as a band, a lot of times getting those people, capturing those people that don't already follow you is a big part of what you're trying to do with your social media. So we can look here and start to see gaps of when are there more space between how many people are looking and how many people are fans of us, because that's information we want to know. So I ended up making another new metric where I subtracted the number of total impressions, impressions from people who like our page, to get this blue line, which is impressions from people who didn't like our page. So now we're trying to figure out. And then the orange line, I have a parameter on here where I can switch between likes, comments, and shares. Because the question I'm really trying to answer here, the factors that I'm trying to figure out is which of these factors, likes, comments, or shares, creates the most stories for us that we get these new people, impressions from these new people. So what kind of things should we be driving? Like um, if, you, if we go through these different fits and try to see which one kind of lines up with the blue line the most, doesn't look like it's comment. Not really likes, there's kind of some stuff over here. Maybe shares, shares looking like it's lining up pretty well. So maybe we want to make the kinds of posts that encourage shares then. If we saw that likes was the one that was getting the most things, maybe we should do, you know, like this or else we'll kill a kitten. 
and then people will like it, and then more people will see our band. I don't know how they'll feel about our band after that post, but that's a different story to take on. So that's factors. So what discussions are you starting? Well, a lot of this is which one of these things affects the metric we care about. So if we care about impressions, likes, shares, comments, which one should we be focusing on? And um, can we use, or can we use one of these metrics to predict the one that we really care about? So if there is a steady rate that we know, um, like moving away from the social media example, if we know that there's like a num certain number of people that come into our store at any given time, we can use that to predict how much sales we're going to have, that kind of thing. So actions that are driven by factors, really the team has a better understanding of what to prioritize when they're trying to control something or predict it. Um, they have a sense of where to invest future vest investigations. So if we have this hypothesis that things that get shared are the things that make the most impressions, which now that I'm saying it out loud, it seems like kind of a no-brainer because then it's going to make a bunch of stories and other people's timelines. Um, but we might want to test that, do some A-B testing, and see what happens if we make the share, it, share this or else we'll kid, kill a kitten versus like this or else we'll kill a kitten. And so some tips for working with factors. Again, working on that kind of idea of building up tension and um, kind of revealing a little bit at a time is a good way to do this. And so I call this the Goldilocks formula. When you're trying to look for a line of best fit, you go, nope, this one's too big, this one's too small, this one's just right. So by the time they find the just right one, they're just like very excited that you found the right factor. Another good factor to do, if there's a factor that everyone just assumes and everyone's working off of an assumption that this is important and in your analysis, it's not. Uh, that's a good. That's like a good way to start your presentation too. Like, hey, this is this thing that we all do and we think is important. Guess what? It's not. Here's three things that actually are. All right, and our last story is outliers. So outliers, basically just pointing out specific areas where the data is different, and then starting that discussion of why. So we'll do social media data again one more time for this one. So these are all of our different posts. All of these brown ones are events. All the oh, highlighting turned off. Whatever. Green ones are photos. These kind of cream ones are statuses. And the blue ones are videos. Again, I have a parameter that I can choose likes, comments, shares. And we can see, let's, let's take a look at shares because we did just realize in the last story that shares are pretty important when it comes to reaching more people, new people, trying to grow your fan base. So we should be prioritizing shares. So what gets the most shares? Well, you'll notice all three of these outliers are videos. And if I hover over them, it tells us kind of what this video was, what was what's the status message in here. So I might just start pointing this out. So this is pretty much the, one of the first videos we've ever made. This is our submission to NPR Tiny Desk, which was actually filmed in the Tableau office. Look it up on YouTube, pretty funny. Um, Tiny Desk got more shares than anything up till that point. And then let's make a new one. This is we made like a little video of cartoons or a cartoon video. It really, so this video was a music video that I just took gifts of cartoons from my childhood dancing. So of course everyone's gonna share that because they're just like cartoons that I love. Someone my age did something. Cartoon video was very popular. And then this one is the, our most legitimate um, 
our most legitimate video, you can see there's all these credits in there. And each one of those credits tagged the person that was in there. And then we also had a whole cast of people. So everyone involved in that video ended up sharing it. So when we worked with a big crew on this video, it got a ton more shares. So maybe that means we should stop being such loners and trying to keep it low budget producing our own things and get a whole crew involved, because then at the very least, they all share it on Facebook. So that's our outlier story. So the discussions are started. Just a really simple one. What happened here? Why is this one so much bigger than everything else? What makes this data point different? Was it good that it was different? In this case, yeah, hell yeah, we wanted all those shares. And what do we do to promote or mitigate this in the future? So I was already starting to have that discussion with myself, right? Maybe we should involve more people in our music videos, get a lot of them in there so that they want to share it. And the actions driven, we have a starting place. So if we're trying to investigate how different things we're doing um, affects what, what we see, Start with those outliers and take those different things we're doing, look at how we're doing them, how they affected those outliers, and if that's different than kind of the baseline of what happened. Uh, the other thing is we figure out how to mitigate or promote outliers like this in the future. So some tips, the farther the outlier, obviously the more impactful the story. So if you want to really, like actually the uh, the other example I had when we were looking at Drill Down and I was looking at that Spotify, um, every, all wh who, who we earn money from when we're streaming, starting and doing something tricky, like starting on a log scale and then switching to the actual scale. So you're like, eh, it's kind of an outlier. And like, oh, no, that's actually really a huge outlier. That's a good, tricky way to kind of get people to think about this. Uh, and then use story, other story types to dig into what makes that outlier different. So again, this is a great place for drill. This might be a good place for um, uh, doing factors, that kind of thing. All right, so those are the seven story types. Now here's just some general overall storytelling tips. So if you need a place to start, you don't know what to do, just think of like your basic five paragraph essay that you used to write for English class. Thesis, point one, point two, point three, conclusion. It's a good foolproof me method to make an argument. You should always start your story with some kind of orienting information. So again, storytelling is not about necessarily making someone feel something about the data. What it's really about is providing context. So start with information that they already know. And again, if you're doing something like drilling or zooming, start at the level of detail they know, and then go down or up to the point that makes sense to them. Keeping your data into consumable chunks. So don't try to say too much in one point. Don't try to make them click too many things in one point. Just try to keep it simple. Try to maybe match like one sentence to every data point. If you don't know where to start when you're starting to make a story, just ask yourself, how did you come to this conclusion? If you're trying to argue that, say you're me, and you're trying to argue, hey, we should make more videos and post them on Facebook. I can start by, how did I get to that, discuss, to that conclusion, and how do I build my story there? And another good like, tip for storytelling is just throw something exploratory at the end. That's basically like a self-service Q&A session. So you go through the story, here's all the data you use, like, OK, if you, just in case you're not convinced, here's an exploratory dashboard that you can touch yourself, and you can ask these questions or go deeper if I didn't go deep enough for you. So speaking of Q&A, we've got like 10 minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. It looks like there is a mic right over there if you want to go speak into it. Ready to go. In the meantime, I will just do more of the like, cool posing I was doing earlier. All right. Hey, Jill. Hey. Um, does 10.5 offer anything that you love for storytelling? Story so 10.5, as you can see, I already use Viz and Tooltips. Viz and Tooltips, I think, is a wonderful tool for storytelling because uh, like one of the points I just made right, was that you don't want to overwhelm people with too much information on every point. 
but you do want to do as much as you can to provide context. So having that other little extra viz hidden in the story point is a great way to do that. Like when we were looking at that map and I'm zooming in and out and looking at all the venues we play at, you don't necessarily need to know how many shows we played at each one or how much we earned, but you might be curious. You might want to know why we've earned so much more at Sunset versus at Tractor. So hovering over and getting that information, if you need it, is a great way to do that. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Viz and Tooltips. Any other questions? Hi, when using contrast, I noticed you use different shading for the two sides of the contrast. It's, mm -hmm. Is that intentional? Yeah, so a lot of times, um, if I'm going to do something that's two completely different topics, so one is when are people online, one is when do we post, I want to use different colors because I don't want people thinking that it's the same piece of data. So that's when I would use two different colors. Any other questions? Hey, you want to go to the mic? <laughs> Okay, so the question was about when you're kind of talking about storytelling as a way of having and framing these discussions, how do you balance that time with creating an impactful story but not getting thrown off by all of this discussion? So that's happening, is that your question? Um, a part of it is Discussion happens afterwards, so you frame the story and then you discuss. But you might want to build in certain breakpoints of like, talk about these things, what do you guys think, seems interesting, and that could actually be a good way to build suspense. So if I'm talking about like, maybe if I'm doing something like combining multiple stories, like if I'm trying to convince my band we need to make more music videos, why? Because we want more shares. Why? Because shares are the thing that get us the most impressions. So those are multiple stories that are all connected. So maybe I would start with one of those stories and say, hey, I've noticed that impressions are important. We, in a way to get those as shares, let's talk about that. So then we start talking about that. Okay, well, how do we get shares? Well, I have an idea about that. Here's like another story about us looking at all of our different types of posts and, oh, see, videos are doing really well. Okay, and so now you've built in those discussions at like appropriate times. Yeah. Hi. I have another 10.5 question. Okay. I don't know if you've tested it. I've seen in the past you've done a lot of visualizations with uh, custom uh, shapes like mm -hmm. images mm -hmm. or even just images embedded uh, filtering. Uh, do you know if Hyper actually speeds up um, you know, filtering out all those custom shapes? I actually I haven't yet, and I'm so excited. There is a place there in the kiosk section kind of near TC Labs where you can hyperize your workbooks and go test them. I'm very excited to take mine that has 718 Pokemon shapes and put it in there and see if it gets a lot faster. So I will report back. I'll watch on Twitter. We'll see what happens. Is there anywhere on the roadmap where you're looking at recording audio into workbooks? So that's kind of a, it's a, recording audio is definitely a thing that I think is really cool. So there's some very cool uh, story platforms, especially there is this new one by a group called Kiln called Flourish Studio. And they have a really cool platform for recording audio and connecting it to these different points of a visualization story. I love it. Um, if anyone from Kiln is here, I want to buy you, so uh, talk to me later. Just kidding, I don't have that kind of power at Tableau. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're interested in, and if anyone here has use cases, uh, feel free to email me or tweet me. I'd love to hear about it. All right, with that, it looks like things are kind of winding down. I'll give you a little extra six minutes here but only if you promise to fill out the survey, tell everyone, best session ever, remember that hashtag, do it, tag it with the, with the pictures on Twitter. And uh, in case you have friends that you think would benefit from this talk, I'm giving it again on Thursday at noon in Bayside B. So see you there. Feel free to talk to me afterwards and take care.